A Marx sí que se había adelantado, ya ha dicho buenas tardes, reitero buenas tardes, unas pequeñas palabras de presentación, introduciendo su bagaje, lo que nos va a explicar. Eh, yo lo tengo escrito, no improviso tan magistralmente como los, mis predecesores en la palabra, y lo tengo escrito porque no quería dejarme llevar por el, la improvisación. Yo decía que en una época de cambio continuo, el aprendizaje, y más específicamente el aprendizaje en el puesto de trabajo, está adquiriendo un papel cada vez más importante como vehículo y herramienta a través del cual las organizaciones, incluidas las públicas, como no, pueden lograr sus objetivos a corto, a medio y a largo plazo. Bajo el término genérico de aprendizaje en el, en el puesto de trabajo, las organizaciones pueden impulsar acciones en aprendizaje formal, como lo venimos haciendo, y también en aprendizaje informal. Pero con el paso del tiempo y la oleada de cambios, el gran cambio, podríamos decir, eh, que ha supuesto el advenimiento de Internet, de la banda ancha, de las, de las tecnologías de la información y de la comunicación, las fórmulas más tradicionales, subsidiarias de aula y el, el curso tradicional, pierden sentido en un mundo en el que lo que sobra precisamente es información y conexiones. Estamos en un ecosistema de, de conexiones permanentes y de información permanente. Es por tanto que cobra fuerza, como decíamos, las metodologías naturales que siempre han estado, recordemos los gremios y la edad media, y que ahora se redescubren incluso por la vía de la, por la, vía de la eficiencia, precisamente. Son menos artificiosas, más ajustadas económicamente, más rápidas y, por qué no decirlo, funcionan mejor. Como la propia ponente a la que presento ahora, Victoria Marsi, ya en el 99, en el lejano 99 del pasado siglo, el término aprendizaje informal fue introducido por primera vez en 1950 por Malcolm Knowles en su trabajo Educación informal de adultos. Desde entonces, muchos autores han escrito sobre aprendizaje informal, el cual no ofrece una perspectiva única ni un solo significado. Victoria... Eh, y otros compañeros sugieren que el aprendizaje informal, ahora ella no lo, no lo, no lo concretará, se basa, eh, eh, tiene lugar, es un proceso de aprendizaje que tiene lugar a través de la experiencia cotidiana del día a día, a menudo a niveles no conscientes. Es único y diferente para cada individuo y donde el control del aprendizaje se basa principalmente en el propio alumno. El aprendizaje informal, por tanto, y en principio en estos días lo vamos a tratar intensamente, es aquel en el que el proceso de aprendizaje no es ni determinado ni diseñado, no es determinado ni diseñado por la organización. Y esto, eh, para mí, pensando en el tema, no es obvio. Las preguntas que se derivan son muchas. ¿Hasta dónde se puede planear y planificar por la organización? ¿Podemos intervenir de forma intencional para mejorarlo, dar más oportunidades? Eh, eh, tenemos la posibilidad de eh, modificarlo algo que en sí mismo es informal son preguntas, bueno, que están ahí puede provocarse intencionalmente podemos los responsables del área de formación en las organizaciones por decirlo de esta manera y relacionándolo con el término serendipia hacer más, que tenga más calidad de serendipia a las organizaciones el aprendizaje por el descubrimiento lo encontré podemos provocar ambientes donde las personas se vean activadas a hacer cosas y que encuentren las interacciones mejores respuestas que le estaban buscando. Ese sería el ideal, el ideal en la organización, tener personas que disfrutan en el laboratorio mejorando. Yo eso lo llamo serendipia y estamos esperando un tratado de, de la serendipia en, en la organización en el puesto de trabajo. Bien, hay ya mucho, mucho escrito. Victoria Marsic es una persona que ha dejado ya en paper, en libros, hay mucha experiencia y podemos hablar de un gran elemento que en estos días vamos a trabajar a través de conversaciones, experiencia, interacción personal, grupos de trabajo tipo comunidad de práctica como compartir, transferencia, observación, experimentación, ensayo y error, eh, práctica, repetición, autoformación, comunidad de práctica, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. Hay múltiples formas que están ahí para ser explotadas, usadas. Puesta, puestas en, en valor. Eh, de todo esto nos hablará Victoria. Hay que decir que ella fue la primera persona en la que pensamos cuando estábamos diseñando el Congreso y a veces es difícil conjugar la, la voluntad de que venga una persona con la posibilidad real. En ella, que estaba en su año sabático, 
contestó de forma entusiasta, dijo, sí, sí quiero estar con vosotros, hacía un año que empezamos a trabajar con el tema y efectivamente después de un año aquí la tenemos. Victoria Marsi, que es profesora de Educación de Adultos y Liderazgo en la Universidad de Columbia, Nueva York, tiene un doctorado en Educación de Adultos en la Universidad de California, Berkeley, Berkeley y un máster en Administración Pública Internacional en la Universidad de Siracusa. Ella es codirectora del Instituto Haber para el Aprendizaje en la Organización. Este instituto se dedica a mejorar el estado del conocimiento, a investigar las mejores prácticas de aprendizaje y el cambio en las organizaciones. Es miembro fundadora del Grupo para el Aprendizaje y Liderazgo, una consultora que trabaja en organizaciones para diseñar y desarrollar e implementar intervenciones estratégicas de aprendizaje para generar una ventaja, ventajas competitivas y ayudar a mejorar los resultados. Ha escrito intensa y extensamente sobre aprendizaje informal, aprendizaje activo, aprendizaje en equipo, cultura de aprendizaje organizacional. Y hoy tenemos la oportunidad de escucharla en vivo y en directo, más allá de la lectura de sus papers. Cuando quieras, Victoria. Um, I'm very happy to be here. At one time, I actually was able to speak some Spanish, but uh, it's been a while, so uh, I will be able to hear you more than I will be able to speak in Spanish. Um, I'm very happy to be here as, uh, as the, as the introdu introducer has kindly talked about what my background and my interest to you. So I'm going to um, talk about informal learning and uh, I'm going to do a couple of different things. I'm going to do a little bit about uh, why it matters. I think all of you know why it matters, that's why you're here, but just to recap, a little bit about what it is. Um, again, there are many different definitions out there and so I don't need to hear myself in English. <laughs> there are many different definitions out there, and so uh, I'd, I'd like to just kind of talk about where they converge and what is really essential um, and what maybe we all differ on depending on where we're located. Uh, I'm going to spend a little time on what we know from research about how it occurs because that will help us to understand what we can do about it. Um, and also uh, spending more time then on how it can be supported. And, As uh, in the introduction, uh, we, we see that informal learning is something that is not as easy to capture as seats uh, in training. We can't measure it that way, we can't design it that way. And so since it goes on in the organization everywhere all the time, how do you really support it? And the research points to three different areas that we can do something about, and that is personal characteristics, in other words, If people learn informally, does everybody learn as well or as equally, or are we going to have to help people with their learning capabilities, figuring out what really works? Uh, secondly, and very importantly, a lot, of ha a lot happens because of where you are on your job. And so we are going to have to look to job design and which, well, how can we make a job really learning full, uh, in, enticing to people to learn, able for people to learn. And finally, there are some things in the organization, barriers and supports is what we often call them, that we have to attend to if we are going to be able to really support informal learning. Uh, and I'm going to end with some time on what you can do, and I'm hopeful to spend more time on the last two areas than the first two. But just to recap a few things. So why does it matter? Uh, first of all, I think it matters to everyone here in this auditorium. Uh, it certainly matters when you have a life crisis, when you're raising children. Uh, when you're figuring out where your career should go, uh, many of the ways in which we make that happen are informal. Uh, secondly, I'm sure your role in the organization makes you come here with a different interest. So uh, some of you, maybe just a show of hands, are responsible for learning and development in organizations. A couple people. Some of you may be managers, leaders, who are coaching people, helping people, design the organization so people can learn. Some of you are consultants or coaches. You work with people about their informal learning. Consultants, coaches, a couple people here. And many may be educators or teachers uh, in different roles. Educators, teachers, great. So we have a number of different people and I hope I can keep that in mind as I go through to offer you different uh, insights into what might work and what might happen. So as the introductory speech has said, The main uh, drive, there are a number of drivers for informal learning, and a lot of it has to do with the changing environment. Uh, in the industrial organization, it was easier to figure out exactly what people needed to do and to make sure they did it that way. 
But in today's environment, with so many changes, we are really looking more at just-in-time learning rather than just-in-case learning. All of us have some just-in-case learning for, in our background. Just-in-case means we need to know how to do it when we come up to that situation. We have our professional backgrounds and trainings. But because everything is changing, the workplace doesn't look like what we prepared for. And so no matter how well your training is designed, how well your education is designed, people are going to encounter differences when they actually try to apply it. And so we need to focus more on what do people need when they need it. Uh, also, the younger generation has very little patience. And so uh, the notion that I'm going to do this for when uh, doesn't fly very well. If, I, if I'm facing it now, I want it now. So, um, you know, a good example that is quite common, we've all faced, uh, faced it, is provided by the Chief Learning Org Officer magazine uh, when they say, you know, you come across some unfamiliar terminology and you have to find out what it means, a, it, a new concept. And so you look it up. You don't usually go to the library. You go to the internet, you go to Twitter, you talk to your friends, et cetera. And that is all examples of why informal learning is so pervasive uh, in the organization. So why does it matter to learning and development? For us, we need to make a shift in the way we think about learning and development in organizations because if we can't make that shift, we can't provide the right kind of support uh, because we are responsible for helping people to grow. And my argument is not that we should throw all of training out because of the fact that our budgets are cut uh, because I think, as you will see from the research, Informal learning works very well for some people some time, but there are many things we're not doing to make it work in the best possible way. And it is very much complementary to training. So we need to figure out how we can support it because the choices are not as much in our hands. The choices are in the hands of people facing the challenge at the point of time when the challenge occurs. And so instead of shaping the learners to fit the pegs of the organization, we have to shape the environment to fit the learner. It is not unlike what we do in, in sales these days. In, if you want a customer, if you want a sale, you better shape your product to the bot person who is buying it. You may, must customize it. You must make it satisfactory to them. And likewise, learners come. People who work for us come with many capabilities, but they want to learn it the way it works for them, not the way we think they should be learning it. So we need to shift the way we think about it. And Jay Cross, who does a lot of wonderful work on informal learning, if you haven't been to his uh, blog yet, you ought to, he compares informal learning to a bike rather than a bus. On a bus, you get on the bus, you go where the bus, we know it's where it's going to go, where it's going to stop, the route is established. On a bike, oh, it's a nice day, I think I'll stop, I have a picnic, I'm going to go off on this way, I want to go fast in this stretch, I want to get there earlier, whatever the case might be. So we are all on bikes as informal learners. Um, there's also the question, as was brought up in the introductions, of, of the financial situation right now and the economic constraints. And it is very true that uh, we have to cut back in, the, in many areas and be more strategic. But in addition to that, over time, and even before these the severe financial constraints, people had begun to study how pervasive informal learning was. And there are many studies out there that, uh, including some done by economists, that suggest that it really is true that there's a lot of informal learning out there, and yet when you look at the budgets of organizations, about 80% of it goes to training. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, how should we spend our money wisely? It's not to say, perhaps, that we have to spend less, uh, although I know all organizations want to do that. Uh, but we have to spend it in different ways uh, because these studies do suggest that about 80% of the learning for people happens informally. Uh, and maybe you all will do some studies that contradict that, but, but that's what's out there, at least in the research up until now. So we look at uh, what people are saying about approaches that drive business value and that really are very helpful to people, and this kind of supports that notion of how pervasive it is. Uh, this was a study done by Burson and Associates of their clients, a very large sample number, and of, those, of that group sampled, 60% said the greatest value comes from on-the-job experience, another 36% from on-the-job mentoring and job rotation, another 33% by coaching. I shouldn't say another because it's 33% of the total, 60% of the total, et cetera. Uh, Formal training is important. It comes in, whether it's provided internally by a company or whether, as we will see, it's provided externally. 
But Twitter and your friends, the social networks are very important uh, for learning. When, when I work with managers in management development, I usually learn that their spouse is very, or their partner is very important to their learning. Um, and they're not on any uh, corporation's uh, list of people they should learn from necessarily, but they became, become very important to it. And then of course, outsider provided training. Uh, so there is a benefit. People say it drives business value. Surveys have also said that it enhances employee performance. One of the problems with the research is a lot of this is perception. And if you'd like to talk more about the, the research problems, about understanding this phenomenon, please let's talk about it in the question and answer period. But ASTD, for example, did a study with Corporate uh, Learning Council, and they came up with the fact that about 99% said that, it can, that informal learning enhances employee performance. And of that group, about 34% said it enhances it greatly. I think the most important argument is that it suits learner preferences and differences. Because we live in a world today that is much more customer-centric, learner-centric, individual-centric. Even in our schools, through K through 12, we talk about differentiated instruction. We have learned that one size does not fit all, that each of us in this room have different strengths, different preferences. Uh, when I try to learn something, I just start experimenting with it. When my husband tries to learn something, he reads all about it first. And so we all have a different approach, and we have to be able to reach people at that approach. And if people are satisfied, they're happy. If they're happy, they're engaged. If they're engaged, they're more productive for you and your organization. So with that background in mind, I asked myself three questions as I looked at the research. Well, first of all, I didn't ask this question of how it is defined, but in fact, a lot of the research said, first starts with how do you define it. Uh, secondly, I did ask, how does it look? What does it look like? What are people doing? Uh, and thirdly, what does it say about how it can be best supported? And so I'm going to go through those things. Uh, we have heard about the definition in the introduction to the, this conference. So uh, this is something that I'm sure you've run into many times. And if I asked each of you in the room, there'd be a slightly different version of the definition. There are at least 20 different definitions out there, but they all converge in these three areas. Um, one is how it happens, and it is organic. It is sometimes incidental, which makes it even more complicated. Incidental means that uh, you don't intend to learn it. You go to learn something else, and you find out something that's far more important. So you might go to a training session that the organization offers to learn specific skills. And what you really learn is that the organization does not tolerate mistakes, that you can't take risks. That's very important incidental learning uh, that goes on. And it's not what the organization intended, but it is what people act on. So uh, incidental learning is very important. Um, but thirdly, it is not highly structured, and that makes it so difficult to plan for if you are sitting in the learning and development role in an organization. Also, people talk about where it happens. They say not in classrooms. Well, of course, informal learning happens in classrooms too, but it isn't, it, what it really means is that it's very hard to plan it as you would a training course. Uh, you have to do things differently when you're planning for it. And finally, and most importantly, is who drives it, and that is you. Uh, it's my way, not the organization's, uh, and it is more or less intentional, which I think is a real key to what we have to do around uh, supporting informal learning, is the intentionality or the purposefulness about that. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just one second, but I just want to show with a couple definitions that reflect those three converging points. Uh, one is the American Society for Training and Development, which is often turned to by training people in the United States. And they defined it in this way for a survey they conducted, um, that it's not formal training or performance support. It does not have a conventional instructor. It is in employee controlled in several ways, in its breadth, in its depth, and in its timing. It's individualized. It's just in time and limited. It's small bites, not large three-day training sessions. Um, and the definition that, as, as was indicated, I've been working on this for a long time with my colleague Karen Watkins, and when we defined it early on, we, we defined it pretty much in those terms, that it happens outside of the formally structured classroom. But we also suggested, as we looked at it, that it often happens when things are non-routine. And so that is the key to the changing environment now that so many people, even if there is a rule to follow, we all find many different variations in, in how to apply it. And so it's being attuned to that that is not routine, and also being attuned to what you take for granted that someone else may not share. 
So for example, if you are working in a team and if you stop and check with everybody on your team, you will have a different idea from each person as to what a team is and what the goal is for that team. People do after action reviews, which are kind of learning reviews. And the biggest learning from all the work that's been done with them is that the first step is setting the goal and, uh, and saying, what did you think the goal was? And if you go around the team and they haven't talked about it in advance, each person will have a different goal. And so you have to be on the same page if you want to get informal learning aligned in the organization. And that comes to the fore in informal learning. And then incidental learning being a byproduct of some other activity, as I had indicated before. So here's this purposeful question. Um, and there's some argument or discussion about it, because if informal learning is organic and not, it's not planned, then how can it really be purposeful? It's not purposeful in the same way as smart object objectives are. Uh, they're not set out in advance by someone else as to what it is people are supposed to be able to do at the end of it. But it is driven by people's interests, and so their own individual interests and purposes. Uh, I use the word intent. It has intentionality, uh, that it's derived from the Latin intendere, which means to stretch or strain towards. So we all strain towards or stretch towards what we're interested in. And that is really what drives that informal learning. So it's more likely when attention is drawn to a challenge, a problem, uh, something you're curious about in the organization. Um, Erout, who does, uh, has done a lot of work on informal learning, and I would recommend him to you if you are interested in looking at a lot of the research in this area, because he studied uh, accountants, teachers, uh, nurses, healthcare workers, many different kinds of professions. And he's identified many different aspects of informal learning in those settings. Uh, and he talks about the degrees of intentionality. And you will see those in some of the examples I talk about this morning, this afternoon. Uh, in other words, it can be simply implicit and unconscious, as was, was indicated uh, in the introduction to my session. Uh, but it can be reactive. For example, you do a lot of informal learning if, in a crisis. Uh, when, uh, when you're faced by a fire or you're faced by some other organizational crisis, you learn a lot, more than you ever thought you could, and it's reactive informal learning. Or it can be more deliberate and intentionally planned, which is what we would hope to do in training and development. So it's not, although the, the literature would suggest that it's contraposed, an either or, formal learning or informal learning, in reality, they're very complementary. And most researchers and practitioners have come to that conclusion. So we have to figure out how to use them together. And a good reason is that when you have informal learning, there is a lot of opportunity for error, for making mistakes. Because we tend to do things the same way we did them before. And without feedback or the right conditions, we don't know that we didn't do them correctly and we don't correct. And so we have all worked for managers who can't understand why it is employees don't feel satisfied with the, their supervision. Uh, and we have, they don't get the right feedback and they don't know what's really going on. So they keep doing the same thing and being perplexed as to why it is they don't get the same re the results they wish. And that's the problem with informal learning. We need uh, corre uh, correcting mechanisms for our own errors so that we can make changes and move forward. So how does the research, what does the research say then about how informal learning occurs? Because this gives us cues to how we can support it. One of the biggest things again and again is context, meaning there is no standard procedure for informal learning. If you look at it in the government, in public administration, it's going to look different than in business. If you look at it in IT, in, uh, information technologies, it's going to look different than it does in a healthcare setting. So one has to really study and map the context of informal learning. You can get many ideas from other organizations, and you should, but when you start to apply them, you shouldn't automatically apply them without first figuring out what works in your organization and setting. And that's a very key lesson again and again and again in the research on informal learning. Uh, but as was indicated, it is learning from and through experience. It is learning especially in interaction with others. So if you have an environment, if you work in an organization where everybody is lined up in cubicles, and the norm in the organization is you can't get up and walk around and talk to other people very much, you're in trouble. 
and I, I was invited in to help an organization uh, that was configured just in that way of engineers who couldn't figure out why it was they couldn't help one another learn informally. But the, the way the, the desks were set out in rows, the way the norms of the organizational interaction were, they couldn't really get up and problem solve with one another. Of course, the internet has solved some of that problem because we do it surreptitiously, um, no matter what. We can do it through our electronic devices. Um, finally, it is intertwined with work. And so you can't really see if people are learning when they're working. Um, it may be that they're applying what they already know, or it may be that they need to learn new things. So uh, we have to look at the work roles and the work tasks and the work processes in order to figure out how we can best support it. And IBM has a good example of how it's done that that I'm going to be sharing uh, later on in this presentation about how they mapped the work processes and roles and figured out how to support learning at those particular leverage points. Um, I'm going to share an example right now from um, uh, one of the studies that one of my students did, one of my doctoral students in a healthcare setting. And I understand that in Spain, Par um, when there is an emergency response to an accident, you always have doctors aboard the emergency vehicle. But in the United States, we have what are called paramedics. They're not fully trained doctors, but they, have, they work in the medical area and they learn a lot and they come to, they're the first responders to an accident. And she looked, she rode, my student, Barbara Lovin, rode with the paramedics for about six months and learned about how it is they learn on the job. And in fact, there was a lot of training in that organization. Uh, that training had to happen. It was mandated by the government. But people did not learn a lot from the training because it was just in case, and it didn't come at the time that they needed it. Whereas, when they were out on a call, they needed to know it right then. And so they said, no matter how many times we go on that call, it is never boring. We're always learning something new because the circumstances are always changing. Um, so they learn more on demand than they do through mandated training. And there are some characteristics that you will see illustrated from how I talked about it just now. So work challenges matter. To what extent are people exposed to work challenges? Well, paramedics are all the time. For example, here's one example. Well, as we pulled up that day, we knew we were in for a mess. There was a truck halfway on top of a car, and the car was hanging over the bridge. So the paramedics had to figure out how to get the people out of that accident without tipping the car and the truck over the bridge and losing them in very short time frames. And they talked about how they did that by trying something, step, stepping back and saying, if we try that, what will happen? Will we cause th make things worse? Will we make things better? Let's try it. And so they experimented. They tried out through trial and error, but informed trial and error, because of course they knew certain things about what did or didn't work. In that setting, and in all of our settings, relationships are key. Uh, so the organization needs to set itself up to be able to have people get to know one another well. Uh, one of Larry Prusak, who a number of you may know from the knowledge management field, uh, one of his uh, favorite sayings is, you know, why is it that organizations spend a lot of money hiring the best people and then set things up so they can't learn from one another? Um, and that often seems to be the, ha be the case. Uh, relationships matter. So in, in the case of paramedics, two people always ride together. And whether they've worked together for a long time, whether they know one another well, maybe they're, this is the first time they've worked together and they don't know what the other person is thinking. So how do they check that out before they learn to solve the problem in front of them? They talk about how the relationships matter so much. They laugh together, they make mistakes together, they get rewarded together. It's a very intense and important part of the informal learning. There are also work practices that we can, we can leverage. The problem with work practices is that they often become routine, check the box. So uh, you've probably had some of those in your own organization and everybody says, well, just wait a while, they'll get rid of them after a while, we'll duck the wave. Uh, but uh, checklists and various work practices can be intensive opportunities for learning. So in this case, there is a thing called the run report after you have had a incident. And when you come back, you fill out certain kinds of information and you, it helps you to reflect. So tacit learning that might be implicit becomes explicit and you can see what you did, what you didn't do, what you could do next time. As one person said, I'll say, you dummy, you should have done the opposite. I'll get to the cause and the effect. 
It makes a lot of difference to finally see all the vital signs written down. Now that I'm writing the report, I think about the legal liabilities, and I think next time I'll be sure to do that differently. Um, the final piece is that people relive these stories all the time. I'm doing a lot of work with storytelling in Bermuda right now for community engagement models. And stories are a way in which we can really relate to one another and to the specifics of the context and situation better than abstract lists, uh, bullet points, for example. Uh, early on in its knowledge management work in the US Army, they learned that they had a uh, database of lessons learned called Center for Army Lessons Learned. And one of the people who I uh, interviewed for a study I was doing said, we should call that Center for Army Lessons because we never learn anything from them. Uh, so you have a lot of databases, but you don't have them in a way that makes it user friendly or easy to access, and you often don't have context. But they took to uh, taking videotape of what was actually going on when people went into a situation. And they took to collecting stories and putting the whole story online. Because it's in the story that you get the context and you can adapt it to your circumstances. And likewise, the paramedics mostly learned from stories that they told to one another in pairs and partners and that they shared when they were uh, working to re-equip their, their vans when they were getting ready to do one thing or another. So reflecting and telling the story is where learning happens for them around the clock. As they said, they run a call once physically, but actually you run it dozens of times in your mind. And each time you think about it and rethink about it in light of new information that you get. Um, so, um, the, the last thing I'll say about some of the studies, and I point you to some of them so that you can look more at them. I want to get on then to what matters to support it. But there have been a lot of studies, especially since Etienne Wenger's work on communities of practice, on natural communities of learners. And I think that is a place where you can go a lot to figure out how to support informal learning. In the early days of community practices, a study was done by the American Quality and Productivity Council, AQPC, and they looked to how to support communities of practice, for example. And they said that what you need to do to support them is to A, get out of the way, and B, you needed to provide some things they need. You need to provide time. Uh, we tend to forget that you can't learn if you're so busy working that you have haven't the time to learn what you need to do it better. You also need time to get together with people. You need people that you respect in terms of what knowledge they have. Uh, so the resources were more in the line of time, space, and access to experts that you really believe in, uh, trusted people who you want to hear from. So uh, that work is very interesting. There's also a lot of work of team learning and team learning studies, some of which I've been involved in. Um, there are many case examples of how people learn in different settings, uh, and I can give you a list of some of those as resources. Uh, the, the strategies that I'm sure we're going to hear in the breakout groups are things like trial and error. Reflection is key. We have to keep in mind that everybody does not know how to reflect. It is a developmental capacity. There are people who really cannot step back and look at things and ask questions about them. And so those people need to learn informally too, as much as do people who are fairly able to step back and reflect a lot. So how do we help them do that? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these strategies as we go forward in terms of, for example, self-directed learning. Some of you may be familiar with a series of case studies that were done a number of years ago by uh, a group called EDC on the teaching firm. And although they set out to look at training, they ended up saying it's really informal learning that matters. And there are a lot of very good examples in that, in that set of studies. And then finally, in Australia, there's a set of research that's being done by David Baud and colleagues on what they are calling integrated development work practices. And what they have done is shift the focus from learning to the work practice. And they look at the work practices and see how, much as in job design, how they are learning rich or not, and they work to try to help make the work practices more amenable to learning, informal learning. So those are some of the studies where you can look at different processes and practices. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk briefly about how technology is uh, driving and facilitating it. 
Uh, and this comes from a study that IBM did of the, the kinds of learners and the kinds of workers that they wanted to recruit for their organization. Of course, IBM is a high technology company, so we are not surprised that high technology is important to the, the learning of people that they hire. But they did find certain things about how their learners need to learn, and therefore they changed the way they provided learning support. Uh, they, they found out that it has to be personally relevant. It's not good enough for the organization to say, eat your spinach, it's good for you. Uh, they, it has to be something they wanted to know. Uh, they, they learn through interactive real world work experiences. They are tired of uh, case studies that are nice but not really what we're doing right now. Uh, they want things to be flexible and bite-sized. They want it to be social and collaborative. Uh, they want to use technology, and very importantly, they're very happy with instant feedback and rewards. So if, if any of you in, are involved in gaming, for example, uh, I myself don't yet do that much with it, but I have colleagues who do. A very interesting study that IBM did with another group called Seriosity of Gaming, in, and uh, they looked at people who play different kinds of war games and other kinds of games on the web, and they try to understand whether or not what people were learning was transferable to leadership and management skills. And they identified certain things that were definitely transferable, particularly in the area of project management. Because when you're on the internet um, and you're playing these games, they're like little projects. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They have rules. They have certain things. You get instant feedback as to whether or not you're successful. You get to try again. And a lot of these same kinds of skills are very applicable to project management. So the instant feedback and rewards is very helpful uh, when we're thinking about how to support informal learning. So I want to switch gears here now. Uh, I want to look at, uh, I think in the beginning, um, we, it was said that situations created with the right climate support informal learning in the introductory ceremonies. And um, I myself started by looking at individual informal learning. But it, I came quickly also to the realization that people cannot be looked at alone. People always work with other people and they work in situations and organizations. And the rules of the organization matter a lot. And so one has to look in supporting informal learning at how to set up the environment so that people can learn in the way they best can. And there are three areas that I would look at in that regard. I, there, are a, there is a lot of research on personal capacities that need to be cultivated, on job design, and on certain organizational factors that really matter. So uh, personal capabilities. Um, many of you may be familiar with the work that Bandura has done for quite some time on self-efficacy. Um, this work is very important in informal learning because uh, people who are confident, who feel competent, who, feel, uh, who are able, feel they're effective, learn more. We do what we can do well. And so one could think about how to support the competence and confidence of workers. Uh, and, and if you think about employees when they come in the organization, I mean, two good examples is onboarding. We spend a lot of money to hire very good people and bring them on board in the organization, but we don't always think well about how to connect them with the right people in the organization, about how to support their learning so they can be effective. And in fact, many new people at high levels crash very quickly, just like new teachers. Uh, they need extra support. Um, another example of a research study that really reflects this, again with IBM, did a study, they began to uh, put, put certain programs on mobile learning devices, your PDF, your iPhone, your Blackberry, et cetera. And they started, for example, with salespeople in the field because they figured if they, if they can help salespeople feel more effective, they're gonna make more sales, make more money, everybody's gonna be happier. And so they figured out how to put applications on mobile devices and they studied the effectiveness of it. And the big thing they learned is that, they, that it made people more confident and more, feel more effective and therefore they were able to produce more. So what did they do? They put them in touch with not only information they needed but also with people that they could consult with at that point of sale. Uh, they could be, you know, they, they didn't have to be highly knowledgeable, but they were experienced in that setting and they could get the kind of information they needed, they could make a difference, they could see the feedback and consequences and their informal learning was able to accelerate. 
So if you think about these areas of competence, confidence, and commitment, self-efficacy. The second is one I mentioned earlier, and that is that informal learning requires you to be self-directed. You can, it can be in your hands to learn, and you may choose not to learn because you're not motivated, you're not interested, or you're not able. Um, I was speaking recently with a manager in, the, in a pharmaceutical company that is moving from conventional pharmaceuticals to biopharma. Very interesting kind of new environment where people have to work faster, move faster, experiment more. And he was saying that we want to empower our managers. And what that really means is we say, it's your job, goodbye, good luck. And then if they fail, we kill them. <laughs> we don't really kill them, but they, the mistakes linger on in their career. And that is not very effective support for informal learning. And he said what we need to do is to really recognize that we have to, we as more senior managers need to sit with them. We need to have to help them figure out how to do this. I'll give you an example from Colgate Palmolive. Uh, one of the things that they do is when they have a new general manager, they send the, ge before the general manager gets placed, he spends time with experienced general managers and he spends time making a new business plan, going down with an experienced manager, helping to look around, do the diagnosis, create a plan, get feedback on the plan by experienced managers so when he hits the ground or she hits the ground, they're running. And so it isn't that you empower people and send them out there, you also scaffold their learning. You provide supports for that kind of learning. And it takes time. So it really bears on the managerial role. And, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute because I think that is one of the key leverage points for informal learning. Uh, so we really need to help them. Uh, we need to recognize, as I said, that some people are not developmentally at the level where they can really take charge of their learning. And there's nothing wrong with that, they just haven't been helped to do it. And so we can provide support and challenge to get them there. But they may be people, for example, who follow rules. So if they are in learning informally, you have to make the rules clear to them as to what, it, what, what are their choices, how can they do this, what rewards will they get. If they are people who are called socializing knowers, people who make meaning in their lives by looking to people they think highly of, you need to make sure that you have good role models around for them, that they respect so that they can learn from those role models. If they are people who are self-authoring, they have it figured out. And I think there's a big challenge around self-authoring people because they're very capable, they will learn on their own, they will take it and run, uh, but they run into challenges when it comes to the area of collaboration because uh, they feel they know it. They have a, a way of understanding things. And so you have your way of understanding, I have way, my way of understanding, but I, if I am self-authoring, I'm not willing to really listen to your way because I think I have it right. And so I think uh, there's a lot of challenge that we have in the learning and development role to help people to learn to cross boundaries and engage with other people who have mental systems that make them learn informally well but only within their framework. Um, the second is personal characteristics, and I think this is easier. When you recruit people in the organization, you look for people who are going to be able to learn informally, who have initiative, who love learning, who have a teamwork ethic, who are curious and open-minded. Um, you also look to your culture and see if you have those people, but the culture is killing all those traits. Uh, because cultures sometimes are very straight jacketing and they don't really help let, you know, foster or encourage those kinds of environments. The third very important piece, I think, around uh, informal learning capabilities, it was pointed to by Airout, but a lot of other people have talked about it, it is pattern recognition skills. In just-in-case learning, we provide a lot of knowledge and skills. We prepare people for certain ways of applying their knowledge but we're not so good at helping people recognize differences in the workplace. And so uh, people can't always recognize, oh, the circumstances are different, but this is the same thing as I did in this other situation. And I'll give you an example. I was talking to somebody who does a lot of coaching, and he said that what happens very frequently is he will see the same, see a client, he'll help them, coach them through a certain situation, the person is up and running, they're doing very well, he doesn't think he needs to see them again, and three months later they're back. And when he asks them what the problem is, the circumstances have changed, but the essential problem or lack of skill is the same. 
they can't recognize that the new situation is like the old situation, and so they can't self-correct. They can't change the mistakes that they might be making. And so help, we can help people recognize patterns. We can help them in our formal training. We can help them in our educational preparation. We can help them in transition programs to the workplace. And we need to do more of that. Um, of course, people need access to resources. And we've talked a little bit about that. Um, Peg Lohman has done a lot of work around uh, surveying what resources are available. So I would suggest that you look to her if you're interested more in this area. Um, we often think of time, money, right, when we think of resources, uh, and those are very important. But the most important re resource, again and again in most studies, is people. And when we talk about people, it means access to people at the time of your need. So it is good that the manager coaches. It is good that you have assigned a coach. It is good that you have periodic check-ins. But when you, when you need to know, you need to know it then. And so uh, an example, again, from the healthcare area, one of my students has studied radiology technicians. And she does a pre-preparation program for them. And she studied what happened when they went into the workplace, when they tried to transfer their skills to the workplace. And uh, one of the most essential things was, you know, people have to figure out what's going on. She studied this in about three different hospital settings. And one of the settings, people had access to other members of the team. Knowledge sharing was very good in that setting. People would talk about things informally at meetings. They would talk about cases. There was a lot of very good help. And so this person had access to a lot of the right people at the right time. But in other hospital settings, you couldn't get access to the right person. And so very critical judgments have to be made when you're taking an MRI or a CT scan, some of which can affect the health of the patient. And having people available at that time or having access to help is really uh, critical and not always easily available. The second area that I would look to is job design. Um, we think in the learning and development area we don't necessarily have all of the power to do this, and we're probably right. You know, job design gets into how, does, how do the leaders and managers of the organization, how does the executive team, how do the top people think about the work, and how do they plan it out in such a way that learning is part of it. Uh, there is a group of people in England who have been studying informal learning through many cases over, over a long period of time. And they have come up with a framework called the Work as Learning Framework. Uh, and they have looked to, they've looked at literature as well. They have found that um, there are many features of the high-performing work team environment that need to be looked at and grafted onto a good workplace environment for informal learning. And part of that is really to look at the job. Uh, as they have said, it's far easier to send people on a f formal training course than reorganize the production line. Uh, or redesign jobs in order to expand opportunities for on-the-job and incidental learning. But in many ways, if we are saying that the capabilities of the organization depend on helping people be as capable as they are, we have to make some adjustments and think about how work is organized and designed to make it possible for them to learn what they need to do. So in their framework, for example, they come up with many helpful suggestions, but they emphasize worker discretion. What does the worker really have in their own hands. How much of it is prescribed, what guidelines are provided, and how much decision do they have over how the work is conceived, how the work is executed, how the work is evaluated. Uh, worker discretion is a place where informal learning is high because you have to make a lot of decisions. You have to think independently and critically on your own. Uh, another way of thinking about this is how work is allocated. Are jobs designed and structured so that there is challenge in them, opportunities for interaction with other people? Uh, so these are things to, to think about. Uh, I love this work by a gentleman by the name of Skull, who's no a Norwegian. And he has done a lot of research on how to measure informal learning. And he concluded, you cannot measure the learning as it happens, because it's too individual. But what you can do is to look to the learning climate, which we all have known for a long time in organizational studies, and you can look at jobs if you can figure out a measure of how learning intensive they are. If a job is learning intensive, there's going to be a lot of informal learning likely to be happening in it. And he came up with a very good uh, study, a lot, of, a, a lot of very large samples, public organizations as well as private organizations, many different sectors 
these are the seven things that he found matter most for the learning intensity of jobs. A high degree of exposure to change and demand. So if things are always changing, you're always learning. You have no choice. Um, managerial responsibility, and that doesn't necessarily mean only high up the line. If you're a first line supervisor, you're responsible for the learning of other people. And then when you have responsibility for others, you learn a lot too. Um, extensive professional contacts. So here the networking piece definitely comes into play because when you have a lot of professional contacts, then you see a lot of examples of how it's done elsewhere and you begin to be able to imagine how it could be done differently in your own setting. Superior feedback, and that does not mean the feedback of superiors. It means high quality feedback. If I would peg one thing that you would fix to make informal learning better, it is feedback. And I would suggest, if you, if you think about your own experiences, that even though we say we give feedback, feedback is not given very often or very well still in most organizations. So feedback that people give to one another, but he says the most important feedback is for learners to see the consequences of their actions. So you have to be able to see if it works or if it doesn't so you can self-correct. Uh, management support for learning, kind of a no-brainer and rewarding of proficiency. So where we're looking is, is looking at the jobs, looking at the environment, looking at the reward systems, looking at the culture, looking at ways that you can be encouraged if you have the motivation to learn on your own. And so we're really in the area of organizational supports and barriers. Um, when people are highly motivated and the organization can get results if they get out of the way and let people learn and work but they need to provide the right supports and remove barriers. And so the question, I think this is the area that we have to work in for informal learning. It doesn't mean getting rid of training. It means being able to provide the right supports to have a good complementary mix of them and use them appropriately together. Uh, and there are four big areas that come out of the literature. There are many others, but these four stand out again and again and again. Trust, which is very much related also to the organization's culture or climate. Structure and communication, and the role that leaders and managers play. So, trust. Uh, I have a colleague who has done a lot of work around trust. He says one of the problems is that we often think of trust as all or nothing. But in fact, it's more like a barcode. When you go to the supermarket and you have a little barcode at the back of a product, and there are different lines of different lengths. And so we trust people differently for different purposes. So I might trust somebody to always come through with the right answer, but I might not be able to trust them to come through on time, for example. Uh, I might be able to trust you with this work assignment, but not that work assignment. And so one has to think differentially about trust. But all of the studies certainly that have come out, for example, of communities of practice suggest that if you don't have trust, you aren't going to have very high learning. Uh, trust helps people get and give feedback, helps them ask questions without fear of making a mistake, helps them communicate freely, helps them to build learning relationships. And so it creates a healthy climate, and that healthy climate in turn creates more trust. And so that is probably one of the most essential things uh, to be able to work on, and I understand it's a very hard thing to do. Um, learning culture. Uh, learning culture, there's a lot of work around learning culture. Burson and Associates have done a certain amount of work in this area. Uh, they have talked about creating a learning, learning agility index, and they've talked especially about measuring learning culture by measuring the ability to reflect and to talk with other people in the organization. Uh, I myself have worked on this area for a long time with my colleague Karen Watkins, through, a, through initially through some work on what we call the learning organization, which people don't talk about very much anymore. But at the heart of the learning organization is a learning culture. And our measure of learning culture, which has been used in many different circumstances, in many different settings, and in many different countries, uh, suggests that there are about six or seven dimensions that really matter. Uh, and those dimensions are at the individual level, the group level, and the organizational level. Over time, we have looked at which ones are linked most closely to results, to business results, or if you're in the public sector, to, to uh, organizational results with your, with your mandates. And we've also looked at things that mediate them and support them. 
And what we have found that the two things that matter most to the business outcome are your leaders. So if you have leaders who model learning, we're back in kindergarten again. In, in kindergarten, how did we learn? In school, in first grade, we learn by watching other people. We learn by watching our peers. We learn by watching the teachers. And in fact, that is the most critical piece for a learning culture, is to have leaders who model learning. And if leaders are doing things that are different, for example, if you're trying to create a learning culture, leaders may have to not only model the learning, but they may also have to say why they're doing that. Uh, because otherwise, the, the people who are there in the organization won't understand. For example, uh, in this pharma company that I talked about, the leader there is trying to model learning. And so he comes to open forums where people are supposed to ask questions. And he says he tries to create an environment where people are free to ask questions, but nobody wants to ask questions. Because in the past, and even in the present, people get punished if they ask the wrong question. And so not only should he model this, but he also has to say, look, you know, this is a new environment. We have to be able to ask questions. And you can ask anything here, and I promise not to punish you. He has to make it explicit. Um, so leaders have to model learning and create an environment for that. And the second thing is the ability to help everybody throughout the organization con to connect to their environment. The more that you make knowledge available to people at wherever they are, the knowledge they need to do their work, they are going to act on it of themselves. They're, if they are motivated, if they have access to the resources, if they have the time, if they have the support, they will learn if you help them to see what's going on in the environment. That's what the research suggests. But there are things that mediate those outcomes. And two key ones are empowering people. And remember when I talk about empowering, it means not just telling them to do it, but to help them to figure out how to do it. It also means that you have to align people around a collective vision. Because otherwise, you have everybody moving in a different direction. And so uh, again, my biopharma example that I was talking about earlier, uh, they have many different ways in which they have to work across the matrix in that organization. Very large global organization, many, many different people bringing drugs out, bringing pharmaceutical products out. And what they have found is that uh, the big problem is in the alignment of goals. Uh, getting goal alignment, again, right in the beginning of a project. It seems like 101, but it doesn't often and always happen. So how do you align people around the vision that you have? Uh, some things we know about that. And second, which a number of people at this conference I know are talking about, is systems to capture and share learning. Uh, and they will have more wisdom on what those are all about. Um, in the examples that I've particularly looked at, it's the difference between systems where you have more or less routine knowledge that can be shared by databases, or if knowledge resides in people. And when knowledge resides in people, the knowledge management system often has to bring the right people together easily so that they can figure out things together. So the distinction of whether your knowledge management system revolves more around bringing people together face-to-face -to -face or virtually or in other ways to figure out things together because they are creative, each situation calls for a unique response, or whether to the extent to which you can rely on databases with uh, questions and answers and knowledge that we know from other situations that we can simply adapt. And then finally, what a lot of us have more control over, what can we can really truly influence? And these are things more at the individual and group level. We can do things to encourage and support collaboration and team learning. We can help people learn how to ask questions, promote inquiry and dialogue. I use a model called the talk model, which is mar modeled after Chris Argyris' work many, many years ago. And talk stands for telling people what we're thinking asking them whether they see it that way or if they have some other view, listening openly to what they say, and keeping open to other perspectives. It sounds very simple and it's very hard to do. Uh, but we can develop skills for people in promoting inquiry and dialogue. And finally, creating continuous learning opportunities. And that gets back to this idea that we have to sometimes have, help people to learn because they may not be used to doing it, particularly in the environments in which we're at. So we have to create the opportunities and help them access them. Now we have uh, a big area of structure and communications. So we, this is very similar to what the research is on innovation. Innovative companies need to be structured like this, and people who learn need to be structured like this. Uh, we need to have support for collaboration and learning across boundaries. And the three things that matter most are openness, decentralization, and alignment. 
And those things come through again and again in the research. So structure and communications need to keep those principles in mind, even though it will look different in everybody's organization. And then we've talked a lot about leaders. And you know, just to recap, uh, the leaders need to model and champion learning. Uh, they need to learn themselves, and they need to know how to help other people learn. And I think the know how to other help other people learn is something we sometimes take for granted. Uh, leaders often are very happy to have your help in figuring out how they can, you can best coach your employees. Um, in the past, we used to send people to training when there was a problem. Uh, we got away from the fact that managers are our best resource for helping other people learn, and we have to get back to that again. And then they can build a good climate for learning. So those two things are key. And in the climate, you need to encourage risk taking, instill values for knowledge sharing, and give feedback. So those are the things that the research says are really most important. So just to sum up, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what you can do. Uh, how am I on time? 55. 55, OK. Um, so we, we talked about the fact that it can be defined in terms of how it happens, where it happens, and who drives it. We talked about the fact that it's not really a contrast, an either or, but it really is a both and. They're complementary. They need to work together. Uh, we talked about the fact that it is really mostly learning on the job through experience, often in tacit ways, not so very conscious. But there can be a way that we can bring that to more to the consciousness, make it more intentional and more explicit, and that helps. Uh, that it's mostly social and interactive in one way or another. That context is really central and key. Uh, and that support involves personal capacities, job design, and organizational factors. So if you put those things together, what are some things that organizations are doing and that you can think of in order to support informal learning better? So what can we do in HRD, learning and development, or as managers? Uh, well, there are four buckets. So the first one is it is up to them, but there are things that you can do to help. The second is there are ways that we can make it easier to learn from work. Uh, the third is that leaders and managers, again, are key. And the fourth is that we really need to work with the system as a whole. Almost all the work is learning framework, the Burson framework, almost all the frameworks I've seen is that if you really want to support informal learning, we have to think about how the organization is structured and make some changes in order to really make that possible for people to do that. And so how do we partner with the business to advocate for system level support for informal learning? So the first is to get out of the way. Easier said than done. We are trainers. We are helpers. We want to help them do it. And sometimes the way we think they ought to do it is not the way they, they think they ought to do it. And so we have to get into the mindset of our learners. We really have to help them figure out what's best for them instead of doing all the work for them and then presenting them with their, all of their choices. So we need to let learners self-organize their own practices. We have to figure out how to give them more choice, no matter what their learning capabilities are. We have to develop their skills in self-direction. And that can happen at almost level, all, any level. Uh, self-direction can be about choices that you have in terms of when to learn, where to learn, how to learn. Uh, it can be about choices, about goals that you're setting and how they fit with the goals of the organization. It can be about choices in terms of your learning style preferences. We, there's a lot that's out there about how differently people learn, your cognitive uh, processes, and whether or not we should, how we should adapt what we're doing to those different uh, ways of learning. So we want to pay attention to people's motivation and interests, to feedback, feedback, feedback in many, many different ways, to the fact that people do learn differently. And so what works for one doesn't work for the other. A big, quick example here is that there is a lot of research on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And so if you have people who are intrinsically motivated, you do not want to reward them with money or external things. It will kill their motivation. <laughs> on the, I see some shakes of heads here. On the other hand, if you have people who are externally motivated, you do want to war reward them with money and with other kinds of rewards because that will work. So you, there are differences between what, re what rewards work for intrinsic or extrinsically motivated uh, people. Uh, the work of DECI, D-E-C-I, is really excellent in this area of motivation and rewards for intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, motivation. Uh, and the last piece is this question of pattern recognition. 
Uh, I think, for example, if you could get managers who work with people on a daily basis to help people figure out more how to diagnose the situation that they're in uh, so that they can begin to recognize different patterns. And to, uh, we can do that as educators also. So as educators, when we're preparing people, we shouldn't prepare them only for one way. We should vary the circumstances and help people figure out what they have to look for in order to adapt it when they really see it on the job. Um, and then finally, developing a resource-rich learning architecture. So in the beginning of this talk, I said I was going to share what IBM does, and this is, is partly in that area. Some of you may know their on-demand learning system, but after they surveyed what they were doing and thought that they have to change how learning is provided, they, they worked in three areas. They call them work-apart learning, work-enabled learning, and work-embedded learning. And the work-apart learning was they took training and they streamlined it, they made it more modular, they used it a lot of technology, uh, they made it blended, they made it just in time, all those good things. Uh, Work-enabled learning is how do you support people when they're on the job and there aren't any resources around. Um, maybe one of the things you can do is to provide access to the right people, protocols for coaching and mentoring. And so they've been working in this area, uh, for example, learning reviews before, during, and after uh, work that you have done in a new area. Work embedded learning is to me the most interesting and it builds naturally in IBM on technology. Uh, and they used a lot of work in the early on that was done on uh, EPSS, um, uh, Electronic Performance Support Systems. Some of you may know those. It's a lot of work at analyzing jobs, analyzing work, and figuring out how to provide an electronic rich way for people to be able to do a job that needs new learning without having to study a lot in advance. So a good example and a short example was in creating a business case. You may have to create the business case for informal learning, but you may never have created a business case in your life. But there are electronic performance support systems that will help you create a business case. And it will teach you the different things you need to do just to get the job done. So it work embedded learning privileges the job. It says we're not teaching you just because we want you to be better for the rest of your life. We want you to get this done better now. And here's what you need to know to do it. And so work embedded learning involves uh, that kind of thing. And I'll give you an example of what they did in the sales function. They, they happened to have a technology that supported sales and they took that technology which maps the sales process across the beginning contact with the salesperson, with the customer all the way to the end. And they said, where along the way are things that people might have questions around or may need new learning? They, they created databases, they put access to experts, they created small learning modules, they created ways in which salespeople could have access to the right things at the right time to get the job done. And so they embedded learning into the work itself. This is another example of a learning architecture. This was developed by Burson. It follows the same lines. You'll see on the left side of the screen, or maybe it's your right, the formal area. Uh, and that area is like the work apart that IBM did. The middle two columns are like the work enabled, and the one on the other end is work embedded. And so there are different strategies that you can use to, uh, for formal, informal, and uh, embedded learning. And I have three minutes left. <laughs> okay, make it easy, learn from work. We've talked about a number of these examples. Scaffolding learning with templates, structures, and checklists much like the run report in the paramedic example, supporting natural communities of interests, trying learning and development designs that combine work and learning. And if you have questions in this area, I'm happy to give you some more examples. I do a lot of work, for example, around action learning, which takes work as a basis for learning. It incorporates it into the training design, and it also takes the tools and helps use them on the job. And those things uh, help people learn right where the most motivation exists. There are also designs that link learning and training. Uh, this design is from a group called Achieve Global. I worked with them on developing an informal to incidental learning continuum, an eye-to-eye -eye continuum, and they thought about how they could build more of that learning into their training designs and work with the organization to build it back on the job for people. And so the upper column are the formal training, below are a number of different informal learnings that get embedded in the organization in collaboration with Achieve Global when they design their work with them. 
We've talked about managers and how important they are. Coaching, helping managers coach employees is a very good place to go if you want to help them around informal learning. And I mentioned that I think a big payoff is working with barriers and supports. So linking, uh, building support to the business goals. Uh, unfortunately, learning and development is often still divorced. We do our thing, business people do their thing. We have to build the bridges between the two. It sounds simple, it's hard. The biopharma company that I'm talking with right now, that's one of the things they're struggling around, is how do we really get learning and development to work with the business lines. Developing feedback intensive learning environments, and there are many diagnostics out there that can help you diagnose the learning culture and learning environment, and, and I would recommend using those. Finally, be authentic. Don't do it just because somebody else is doing it. Uh, informal learning has to build organically on what's good for your organization. You may have to shake things up so that what's good is different, but you have to be true to some things in your organization. So don't uncritically import best practices just because another organization is doing them. It may not work in your organization. Beg, borrow, and steal, but build on what works for you and keep it authentic and organic. All right, did I make it? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Eh, tenemos, bueno, felicitar a Victoria. Para mí, es opinión subjetiva, ha sido magnífica su intervención. Eh, hacemos un tor turno rápido de preguntas hasta las cinco. Cuestiones. Voy a empezar yo. Eh, Victoria, sí, el retorno te llega, ¿no? I am, I am. I'm getting the translation. Okay. <laughs> Just get on my ear. <laughs> eh, has, eh, de toda tu intervención magnífica, es como caja de herramientas y como elementos a disposición han sido muchísimos. Es decir, habrá que estudiarlos, eh, profundizar, avalados por investigación empírica, que es lo más importante, y aprobados. Es decir, son muchas ideas juntas que es un, un, algo que será muy positivo. Mira, me ha llamado la atención, porque no había caído tanto, en el papel eh, relevante, eh, cuando leía tus eh, artículos, cosas que habías escrito, siempre te ponías aprendizaje informal, liderazgo, liderazgo la relevancia importante de los líderes en las organizaciones para hacer fácil y hacer fluir bien este entorno de aprendizaje. Has mencionado el, coach, el coaching, etc. En los NBAs, eh, en las escuelas de negocios, ¿se es consciente para ofrecerlo como un elemento importante en la capacitación de los directivos, la relevancia que tienen para que aprendan sus empleados o hay margen ahí de mejora eh, en, en estas personas con responsabilidad en las organizaciones? Well, once again, uh, the question in business schools is which business school? Uh, so I'm not as familiar with the business schools here in, in Barcelona, although I do know some of the work that's going on at ASADE, and I, I think they are trying to take some of that into consideration at ASADE, uh, but they may well be at other business schools also. Uh, at the Columbia University Business School, um, they are doing more in the area of integrating learning and helping managers uh, learn. Um, a number of years ago, I worked with one of the people there, Willie Peterson. Willie Peterson has developed a lot of work in the area of strategy, and, and he and I did a lot of work around this area, and he's created a strategic learning cycle, which incorporates learning directly into the building of strategy. And he spends a lot of time on what kind of learning is needed that managers and leaders have to support uh, their people for in making this work. And he's come up with an idea, for example, of a personal credo. What do I believe in as a leader and manager based on my life experience and how am I going to use that to help foster learning in the organization? So I do know there are some people in some business schools that do this work. I don't think it's as prevalent myself as it ought to be. There are many people in England who work with action learning who have been trying to build this more into the business school environment. So my own guess is that it's not happening enough, but I do think it is a place where a, a lot of leverage could be gained. Hola. Sí, adelante. Hola, buenas tardes. Soy Asunta Neas de la Universidad de Barcelona. Tengo dos preguntas 
a Victoria muy concretas. Una, la primera, la implementación de los sistemas de calidad ISO está, y, bueno, y la, la forma de, de muchas organizaciones está haciendo que se hagan muchos procedimientos, ¿eh? se procedimentalice mucho las, las actividades eh, profesionales. Entonces, ¿hasta qué modo eh, esta, esta forma de trabajar en procedimientos tan, esta, eh, tan estructurada facilita o limita la emergencia de este aprendizaje organizacional? La segunda pregunta hace referencia a… Mi, mi foco ahora se centra en las personas que trabajan en puestos de trabajo de poca cualificación, donde el entorno es poco estimulante, es rutinario… Hay mucho trabajo individualizado, solitario, no hay el feedback. Entonces, mi preocupación es si para estas personas también se puede generar aprendizaje organizacional o es más fácil que se genere en, en, en puestos de trabajo con más cualificación. Gracias. Ok. Uh, the first question around quality is, I think, a very interesting one because quality work has many of the features that uh, system level learning should have. Uh, total quality management is a system approach and many of the processes and procedures really do, are supposed to be integrated and they should lend themselves to learning. So this is the same kind of uh, challenge that I mentioned with the paramedic study around the run report or around other tools or checklists in the organization. Uh, these processes and procedures can be It rigidly implemented, they can be implemented in a way that does not engage people's thinking, or they can be used also as a mechanism for learning. And I have a personal example in this area. I worked with a, a public utility company that was likewise uh, putting total quality management processes in place. And they spent a year doing training, and when they finished the training, the only thing that the employees could learn from that was that they should do brainstorming. That's the only tool they took from a year of training in total quality management. And so we came in with an action learning approach. And it was a struggle at first. But we were able to work with a business partner and, and use their business goals. And so for a couple of years, we worked with them uh, with an action learning approach to help infuse learning into the processes and procedures. So people worked with their own personal learning challenges, the goals that they were setting, as well as projects in the organization. And I, I have a wonderful story from that that relates to your second question also. Um, because we were working with what they call the pipes and wires guys. We were working with first line supervisors that are at the point of the worker, uh, the worker interaction. Uh, and uh, they don't have a high level of education necessarily and they're not so used to learning on their own. Uh, and in fact, some of them really had difficulty with the idea of stopping and reflecting. Uh, the idea of when you do something, you can learn from it if you look back and review it and figure out what went right, what went wrong. And in fact, in one of our groups, uh, one of the people said, I would rather eat glass than do this reflection. Um, so he was very vociferous. And we said, okay, just listen. You know, you don't have to really reflect. And by the end of the training, by the end of the program, he was one of the most active learners in that group. So I think that the problem with the quote unquote low level workers doesn't necessarily mean they can't think. They might in fact be able to think better than some highly educated workers. And so I think we should not say that if we have low level workers, routine work, that we should, we could, we can't, we have no hope to foster informal learning. I think this, it's a big, it's harder to do. And there is a lot of training that's needed also. But I do think that if we can think about the way the environment and job should be designed, we may be able to reconstruct certain areas to allow for more learning. Another example in that area, from Korea. One of my students has been working in Korea with very low level workers, very routine jobs, small family owned businesses. And he has created, um, by interviewing people uh, and making, using pictures and videos, he has created job aids that are very graphic, very pictorial in nature, where people, as they do the work, can go in and find out how other people are doing it. And it's become very helpful in small business owners in Korea. So I think we can be creative and inventive when we are working with this idea with uh, lower level workers, lower, less educated workers. Sí. 
Sí, por aquí. Hola, muchísimas gracias. Carlota Riera, de la Fundación Universitaria de Albayas. Uh, mi pregunta, uh, tengo una pregunta que, que, que me sugiere, básicamente sale de, la, de las cualidades de, del aprendizaje informal, que son, como hemos dicho, orgánicos uh, al momento y para la resolución de, de, de problemas uh, relacionados con el trabajo del momento. Y que me parece, intuyo, que deben ser problemáticas muy técnicas, es decir, que estamos, uh, en todo caso, es un aprendizaje que se utiliza mucho para resolver aspectos técnicos del desarrollo uh, personal en el trabajo. Mi pregunta es, ¿hasta qué punto puede existir un riesgo a cierta deshumanización en el trabajo si nosotros como responsables de formación ponemos el foco en este aprendizaje informal, es decir, en aspectos básicamente técnicos? Bueno, no sé si... O sea, si repetiré la pregunta, voy a intentar formularla de otra forma. ¿Es posible que poniendo énfasis en la importancia de aprendizajes informales, que por lo tanto son básicamente técnicos, Uh, estemos empujando las organizaciones hacia una tecnificación excesiva y nos estemos olvidando de elementos más uh, humanísticos? Well, the, it's interesting that you came away feeling that maybe because I was offering you tools that I was focusing, focusing more on informal learning as technical. I don't think of informal learning as primarily technical. I, I can see it happening and in fact I think in areas, for example, managers and leadership development uh, at higher levels of the organization, it's not highly technical. It is very, you know, very complex, the decisions people are making. But the informal learning is probably higher when people are used to or being trained to uh, learn on their own and be able to make decisions on their, on their own. So I don't really necessarily see it as highly technical. Uh, nonetheless, I do think there is a danger um, in thinking that if we uh, if we that that we want to focus on informal learning because it's cheaper, uh, and and that in that sense it can be creating an environment that's dehumanizing because we're not providing opportunities for people to be as much as they can be in in the workplace. I think that's a, not necessarily inherent only to informal learning. I think that's also true for training. So. I think there is a question in all organizations in, uh, as, I, as I talk about it with some of my students, uh, I follow the work a little bit of Habermas in Germany and he talks about this difference between the life world and the system. And the two have to coexist. The system is how we want to get people to do what we need to have them do in organizations. The life world is informal learning. It's organic, it's natural, and it often enriches people for its own sake. So I think it's more a question of how you conceive and manage the learning environment than it is of informal learning versus training. Alguna alguna pregunta más? Sí, aquí. Sí, aquí. Aquí, aquí. Javier Hernández, Centro de Estudios. Mi pregunta irá referida a la formación informal de los directivos, de directivos que en la organización ocupan puestos solitarios, por ejemplo, los directores de centros penitenciarios, por ejemplo, los jueces, por ejemplo, los directores de centros de justicia juvenil. ¿Cómo crear ocasiones facilitadoras o posibilitadoras de aprendizaje informal en personas que están en situación de, de soledad en relación a los contenidos de su puesto de trabajo. That's an excellent question. <laughs> um, I think it's also a, a challenge the higher up you go in the organization, um, what, no matter what the organization is like you get very isolated and you cannot actually talk to everybody else in the same way um, that you would if you're in, well, if you have colleagues at the same level. So, uh, so I think there, there are a couple of ways to provide for their informal learning. One that people are using is increasingly coaches. So if you want to work with people individually who are in that role, you get outside coaches who have a learning approach and who help people figure out how they can learn informally on their own. 
Um, and they may access, if you think of that learning architecture, there are different tools that they can access. With the internet and with technology, we can access people in other places. Uh, we can, in fact, uh, create our own communities of practice with people that way. Um, but I do think that the whole area of social networking, uh, the area of being able to come together with people uh, who are in similar roles to be able to learn together is very, very helpful way of that kind of learning. So uh, I can imagine, for example, an action learning program for those people where they are in those roles but in different, dispersed in different locations and work on real challenges together through a peer learning process that's supported by a learning coach and that helps them as they work a particular challenge to also build their own learning, working on their own personal learning goals, et cetera. So I think we, we have to provide in some ways by, by taking them out of their isolation, by providing a, an environment where in fact they can learn with and from other people. So those are some ideas. I, I hope that's helpful. They may not be the only answer to that challenge, and I realize it's a very difficult one. Well, my husband just coached me here. <laughs> uh, he gave me the example of company command. Um, many of you may know in the US Army of a, of a wonderful organic network called companycommand.com. And this network started for exactly those kinds of reasons, that company commanders are often working in isolation from one another, helping people who are in the front line, life and death situations, and they found that they couldn't get easy answers through the bureaucracy because if they had to go all the way to the top, by the time they got the answer, the problem had to have been solved. It, it went away or it wasn't solved or there was a new situation. And so they formed an organic network called Company Command. Initially, it was a public network. It was on Yahoo or MSN, I'm not sure. Uh, but eventually, it moved to West Point, and it's supported by the Army. But in that network, they have ways in which uh, people can be in touch with one another. They ask one another questions, share lessons learned. It's a really vibrant learning community, a really good example of, uh, of, an, of an organic network that's technology supported that really works very well. Sí, las dos preguntas juntas, bueno, una pregunta final, sí. Ver, eh, José Ramos, Universidad de La Coruña. Eh, en las prácticas mm, profesionales de los futuros educadores, que seguramente usted también conoce, eh, confluye tanto el aprendizaje formal, porque esas prácticas es aprendizaje formal por definición, con una situación de aprendizaje informal. Y, sin embargo, casi siempre el esfuerzo que hacen las instituciones educativas es de intentar controlar los procesos de prácticas y muchas veces eh, parece que ese control puede evitar y empobrecer las experiencias eh, espontáneas que podían tener eh, estos alumnos en, en ese entorno. ¿Ese intento de control cree que es eh, negativo o, o es positivo? That's a loaded question. <laughs> I, think, I think it's the case of physician heal thyself uh, for educators. Um, I think we do have to step away from the control function and you know, you may know the expression guide on the side versus sage on the stage. Uh, we have to be guides on the side. Uh, that doesn't actually mean that we lose complete control because the control is in setting up the environment. It's making sure that we understand what learners need. It's making sure that the resources are in place for them. Uh, but we have to get out of the limelight and let them interact with one another. Uh, so I think this is a classic problem. Um, there's an Australian educator by the name of Phil Candy uh, who has done a really a lot of work looking at self-directed learning. And he has a lot of uh, conversation in his book and in his writing about that exact problem. Educators need to be able to act differently if we're going to, in fact, foster informal learning. We can't control. If, if, we, if we keep controlling the actual teaching situation, we interrupt the learning situation. So we have to control the environment and what we do to support the environment and not the actual interaction between people. 
That's a roundabout way to your dilemma. <laughs> Bien, muchas gracias. Damos por acabada la magnífica conferencia de Victoria Marsic. Y simplemente un aviso. Después del café, a las cinco y media, Simposium 1, en la planta de entrada, aulas 3 y 4. Simposium 2, planta segunda, aula eh, 11. Y Simposium 3, planta segunda, aula 12. Muchas gracias.